Hello, and welcome to Crew Call, the Below the Line podcast by, for, and about the crew. Today's guest is a costume designer and a fashion designer. Welcome, Eden Miller. When did you get started in the business? I actually had a pretty crazy start. I, uh, I've been working since I was eight years old in garments, and uh, I then moved on um, from theater into film in the early 90s, right out of college, uh, doing some very low-budget independent movies and learning the ropes. But I was also very lucky because I had worked in theater that a lot of those designers had crossed over between theater and film and worked in the um, in the shops that I had also been working at. And so I got to meet uh, some of the big luminary costume designers working on big projects who brought me on to their projects as kind of a, a lower-end assistant. And I really learned the ropes from the masters that way. I was very, very lucky. So what was the first show or movie that you started working on? Uh, the first thing that I worked on... Um, Let's see. The first movies, I worked on a couple in a row of a bunch of Woody Allen movies in a row, uh, Manhattan Murder Mystery and Bullets Over Broadway, and then Man- and then Mighty Aphrodite. I think that Manhattan Murder Mystery was the first one then. Was working in film always the direction you wanted to pursue, or did you just fall into that department? Um, was there any other career you were interested in as a fashion designer? Uh, by the time I was in college, I was definitely aiming for it, but I wasn't actually aware that it could be something that you did for a living. Um, up in, uh, I mean, I thought that you did theater, and that's and that the idea that the studio system was still in place, even though I was coming up in the 80s and 90s, um, I thought that you had to be in in Hollywood, in the studio system, and working at the big rental houses or within uh, you know the Warner Brothers back lot for you to come up as a costume designer. So I was very lucky that uh, I came up in that indie world when it was really just budding. Is there a difference when they say costuming or wardrobe, or is it one and the same? Uh, Costume and wardrobe are definitely not the same. If you're referring to wardrobe as in the wardrobe supervisor and the set costumers, the costume designer is responsible for working with the, uh, the director uh, as a creative process to try and figure out what the look for the film is going to be, what all of this is going to look like um, creatively, as well as working within the budget that the producers have given. Uh, it's a more creative position, but it's also, there's a lot of minutia to it. The wardrobe supervisor has less creativity, much more management, but is in charge of the continuity of the film, in charge of the management of the crews and the teams and how to care for your actors uh, in the best possible way to make sure that what looks what it looks like on camera is what the designer and the director intended. Uh, as far as wardrobe styling, that's a whole third planet to itself that involves, it tends to involve um, less about storytelling in long format and more about uh, immediate recognition for the brand that the item is being sold. If that item is celebrity themselves or a product, uh, a physical product, the the clothes support that. So uh, it's much more microcosmic. So your first step is the research of the project. Now, what happens after you do the research? What is the process thereafter? As a costume designer, some of it in the beginning has to do with a ton of research. Uh, I love getting really granular on my research, figuring out exactly what these people would wear, uh, be it uh, present day, contemporary, or if it's period. In some ways, period is easier because you don't have as much sway to the ego. It's much more about serving the story. And um, in contemporary, it's much more about where would this person, given where they live, what their economic situation is, who they're trying to impress, who, how they feel about themselves, where would they shop and where would they find their clothes. So you're telling stories just by how that person gets dressed in the morning as if they are a real person because they become flesh and blood through your collaborations with the actor. So a lot of detail goes into everything 
as you're reading the script. Like I didn't even think about how a costume from day one to day 22, as you were saying, you have to like age it or, you know, it has to look a certain way. Sometimes the um, the costumes are very clearly delineated within the script of what the writer wants, what the director wants uh, is given forth in notes. Uh, sometimes you have much more of an open um, framework to work with. But first you're scanning the script for any of these clues. Even if it's a functional clue, like somebody put something in their pocket, you need to have a pocket for them to put it in. Um then you're also reading with the mind of the technical needs of is this person going to be running across, um, you know, a sewer grate? They can't wear stiletto heels because the, the heel will go in and they won't be able to walk across it. You'll need to block your heel or a flatter shoe or something. Um, you're always trying to consider the environments that they're in, uh, as well as working with the production designer on what their ideas are uh, for the environment so you don't have a beige person wearing a beige suit on a beige couch in a beige room. Um, so you're really working to spell everything out in the, um, in the production's language that's already, that's hopefully cohesive. So then some of it becomes sourcing or building. Some of it is speaking to the actor about their needs or desires or wants. Some of it has to do with if there's stunts, making sure that you have all of the pieces. Um, so, for instance, if it's a fire stunt, everything has to be a an organic fiber, not meaning like you know farm raised, you know the chickens, but meaning it won't melt and fuse to the skin. Um, and then you have to get multiples for stunt scenes. Um, sometimes you have to consider if it's going to be that the actor gets wet, not only dupes but also going wet to dry, wet to dry. Uh, all of those technical needs uh, as you're figuring it out and you're doing the breakdown based on the script day breakdown um, of when this person starts wearing the clothes, what does it look like if they wear it for the entirety of the movie, um, how aged is it by, you know, hour 22 within the script days of the movie. Um, so you're, you're looking at it with this particular filter as you're, starting to put your ideas together of who this person is and what they wear and why they wear it. Um, and then you're also trying to think, okay, well, if it's supposed to play for summer, but it's really filming in December in Alaska, how are you going to underdress it in a way that's elegant? Um, so considerations like that. Then you go about sourcing it, building it, finding if you're having it built, you're looking at fabrics and fabric swatch, swatches, um, you're researching the shops that you want to use. You're hiring teams of people to work with you, um, assistants, uh, shop builders, whatever it might be, uh, depending on the budget size and what you can do. Um, and then you have the then you're looking also at the um, the AD's shooting schedule to see what's coming down the pike, who's going to need what first, so you can prioritize your actions. So it's quite a lot of balls in the air. Now let's talk about the structure of your department. How many people are in it? What are their titles? And then what's the order of authority in the costume department? Okay, so the structure of a department really, really, really depends on the contracts that you're working with uh, or the size, frankly, the size of the project that you're on. Um, some, some projects have contracts that are specifically delineated so that you can or can't use uh, costume PAs to do roles that should be union positions. Um, some indies allow you to have interns. Uh, my personal sensibility is, is that there needs to be more people learning how to do the job before they step up to a professional role where they're relied upon. But I think some of that is also weeding people out through the process of being on film after film after film and having them keep their eyes open and their mouths shut. But that's my personal feeling on it. Um, the other, so anyway, um, there's it's a parallel track in that the costume depart, the costume designer, pardon me, the costume designer is the head of the costume department. However, the wardrobe supervisor is also considered a key for the department. 
in that the costume designer hires the wardrobe supervisor, but the wardrobe supervisor is working in tandem with the costume designer on a separate track. The costume designer has hopefully um, one assistant, two assistants, maybe more, depends on what the project is, um, who can go out uh, and help them do the job of creating all of these uh, costume changes for people. Um, or uh, alternately approving background or dressing background or taking over a certain group of people. Um, let's say the, uh, the star is someone who needs more hand-holding and taking up a lot more time than the costume designer, and the costume designer has these other 740 people to dress. Um, maybe some of those pieces that aren't going to be too emotionally invested might be given to the assistant costume designer. Uh, you also hopefully have shoppers who are able to go out and do the bidding of the costume designer and the assistant costume designers uh, who will be able to, you know, go pick up 17 pairs of shoes in a Cordovan brown alligator with varying square toes in a size 12, you know, um, because again, there's only so many hours in the day. Uh, there's a costume coordinator or a, sh- uh, or a shop coordinator um, who's in charge of getting the receipts in, tallying the receipts, checking in and checking out garments that are in through product placement, working with product placement on the behalf of the designer uh, and the assistant designers so that they can try to get all of the paperwork together so that they can get product in, um, pulling those things together and then transferring things. Basically, the coordinator coordinates. It's exactly what they do. They make sure that everybody is on track for getting pieces together, uh, scheduling uh, fittings, whatever they might need. Um, there's a lot of responsibilities that kind of move over and around. A lot of it, though, is uh, bookkeeping because once you buy something, over a certain amount of money, and that depends, again, on the accounting department and the project, it's considered an asset and it has to be tracked. Uh, and each uh, accounting department has its own rules for what uh, needs to be paid attention to with um, with wardrobe. But the other side of that is it's also um, it relies heavily on petty cash uh, and petty cash flow. So making sure that all of the receipts come in and out and get submitted, and then if there's returns or exchanges, that those receipts can be pulled back out and moved so that there's accountability on the budget and the producers relax and allow you to do your job and let you let you move through. Now, the wardrobe supervisor is in charge of their own breakdowns of uh, of matching it up with the script supervisor's day breakdown um, making sure that they have all of the characters noted and moved through. So each one has a change bag. Each one has a label. They have to know where, what every single piece is that goes into the closet of the person, uh, who's wearing, or for the character who's wearing the clothes. They need to make sure each piece is prepped before it goes on to the backs of the actors, move them in and out of the dressing room, um, Make sure that they get laundered, they go out for dry cleaning and come back in time. You're not missing a piece of clothes because it's part of the cleaner. Um, make sure all of the alterations are sent to the stitcher uh, or stitchers or shop, uh, depending on what that needs, so that everything is ready to go on the day. They are also responsible for hiring the wardrobe crews, which are the regular key costumers who are pretty much there every single day, the, the person who pays attention to the stars. Um, and then additionals who are brought in as needed for scenes or small scenes. Um, and that's also considering for things like nude scenes, wet scenes, stunt scenes, um, cold, hot, whatever it might be, providing for the actors comfort and um, discretion. So making sure that everything is prepared and all of the supplies are there and everything is clean. But there's also SAG rules as far as what it, when things need to be clean, how clean they have to be, what you're allowed to do and not do as far as touching people, um, as far as the clothing, touching them. Um, so sometimes, uh, so, and also making sure that you have every single piece accounted for both as it goes out and comes back after that person has wrapped. Uh, so then the set costumers, um, along with the wardrobe supervisor, 
and uh, so they end up setting the rooms and um, and clearing the rooms. So you'll have a dressing room, like a honey wagon or a, a tea banger or whatever, and um, or private dressing rooms on a on a stage. And that stuff will be set in the person's, in the character, I'm sorry, the actor's dressing room before they come in, along with any undergarments they might need, choices that they might want, that the costume designer might want, or that the actor has expressed interest in, for instance, maybe six different kinds of bras, whatever might work best under this particular thing, Um, plus. Usually, if it's um, heels, you also put in um, comfort slippers, comfort robes, whatever is comfortable for them, so that when you get on set, especially if it's something like a nude scene, uh, they don't take off their clothes and suddenly there's like, they've been wearing high socks that have made red marks on their legs or tight jeans that now they've got red marks all over you know their waist and legs, so it's not as pretty, and then you have to wait until that goes away. So you have to kind of think ahead for that kind of thing. Um You also hire and assign according to the comfort of the, um, the actor. Sometimes it's things like, um, I find if I have an older male actor who's kind of seasoned in the business, I often hire someone who's got a more even keeled temper. Who's kind of, you know, an old hand at it. It's not going to come at them with a lot of youthful energy because it's too much for them in their face at five o'clock in the morning. So you kind of try to match up the personalities as well. Um, And then you also, it depends, most of the time you're moving from stage to locations. So then you're in the process of uh, loading from your stage or you're holding into your truck. And then once you're on location from your truck into your location holding or wherever you might be, making sure you all have all your pieces because you don't get anything extra to take with you. So that go, that's a ton of things up in the air there. There is a lot involved in your department, more so than I even had realized. Um, a lot of complexity goes into what you do. A lot of different positions, a lot of different responsibilities. It is a lot of stuff, but if you think about the idea that this person is going on camera and they have to be emotionally vulnerable or emotionally someone other than themselves, and they can't just leave and say, you know, these these shoes hurt, or I'm naked in front of 40 guys, or whatever it might be, or I'm on fire, you know, you have to provide for them and you have to make sure that they're comfortable and they can do their job without thinking about, is this, you know, blouse showing my bra? So how do you deal with the nude scenes? Do you use things to cover them up partially? Um, What is involved when you're on set? There's a ton of really crafty products out there that you can use. There's there's whole departments of it. There's a a company called Manhattan Wardrobe Supply. There's another company called Bra Tenders. They make things specifically for nude scenes. Like there's for guys, there's something called a sock. It does not go on your feet. then there's also um, there's something called petals. It's basically a sticker to go over nipples. I mean, at, at some point, my personal opinion is that at some point it gets a little bit ludicrous, but I understand the idea that you want some kind of privacy, especially if you're supposed to be in this intimate situation. However, part of it is also um, you close the set. You don't have anybody else there except the costumer who is responsible for jumping in there with a robe and throwing it around the person. Uh, and hopefully not like it's, it's more about consideration for privacy, you know, don't have them standing there waiting for the robe, having have the robe right behind the camera so that you can jump out as soon as, as soon as it's done and, and cover them. And, um, you know, being discreet and still cool about it, not, not being embarrassed by it because they have to be on camera. And if, you're transferring this energy onto them, then that's bad news. So just being like, Oh, and here's your robe. Um, are you cold? There's heat, there's hot hands in the pockets so that you can stay warm. Here's some fuzzy slippers, um, little things like that. Um, but part of it is also talking to the costume designer to talk to the director well beforehand, find out exactly what they intend to shoot talk to the actor, find out what the actor is comfortable with as far as what they're willing or willing not to show. 
a lot of times theater actors are all just like, whatever, everything's out. They don't care. They've just been in public dressing rooms for so long. And um, especially new to the business, film actors are the ones who are very, they don't want to show anything to anybody in any shape or form. It's like, all right, well, I'm kind of like a doctor in this way, but okay. But, um, you know, you respect their needs. But um, if the scene doesn't need to have them, you know, completely naked to the wind, you can get artful, you know? You can, you can, you can say, okay, well, we'll do the petals and it's just from the waist up and then there's a sheet over the bottom or whatever, or we're only going to see this hip. So we can actually put you in, you know, a pair, a, a pair of panties, but then cut that one strap and then put a little tape on your thigh on that side. So you're still covered. It depends on what they're co- comfortable with. So it's it's a conversation between the actor, the director, and you and the costumer. And just what you end up doing is, because you don't want to jump in and out of a closed set, you basically send your costumer to set with everything they might possibly think of needing, including, a, including like um, comfy pajamas that won't leave a mark so that they can just slip into that when they're done so they're not just wearing a robe. Considering all that you've just told me, do you need to develop relationships with the cast members to do your job? I think that what ends up happening is, is that the, um, the hair and makeup department and the costume department are so intrinsically part of creating the personal image of what the actor is putting out there that they tend to have a much more personal relationship. They're, they're much more, uh, you hope to have a friendly working relationship with your actors and that they get along with you and agree with you. Um, it's also where I think that the research comes in because you don't want to like hammer them. This is what you're going to wear because they're the one who has to wear it convincingly on camera, not you. So a certain amount of flexibility is in there as well. But, um, you know, if you say, for instance, I had one actor where, we were doing a film in that was set in 1920s a farmland in rural Minnesota. And he's like, well, this guy is a Norwegian farmer. He would have worn overalls. And I showed him picture after picture from like a historical foundation photograph of that era, of those towns that we were shooting in, that these guys were wearing suits. Because it's not a gentleman farmer thing. It's just what you wore to work, to do your work, was a suit jacket, shirt, and pants. Um, and so once I showed him photo after photo, he was mesmerized by it and he got his cues from it and was totally on board about why I was putting him in these pieces and went for it. So I was able to inform his character that way. It lets him allow himself to let go of doubt. And that's part of it is taking away that key of responsibility as a designer I need to take away that responsibility from them that they don't have to shoulder it. Right. That they can work on the emotional development of the character and um, memorizing the lines and having it flow through them intrinsically as their own. Um, especially when there's rewrites, you know, morning of and things like that. Cause that always happens. Put on the clothes. They are that person until they take the clothes off. From the very beginning, when you get on a project uh, from the, research going through the process of picking out costumes and reading the script and looking at all the details that you need to do all the way down to developing these relationships with your actors. What would you say is the most difficult task of your job as a costume designer? There's two things that I have personally, me myself have a hard time with, which is, both kind of operate under micromanagement. One is when you have a director who falls in love with the idea of something. However, they are so on top of it that they are unable to separate themselves from the idea of the person wearing this thing from what makes sense in the story. And it doesn't matter what you tell the person that it doesn't make sense for the character. It doesn't make sense for their demographic. Um, You see this a lot when it's like there's, some middle class, uh, middle class character wearing Gucci or Valentino or something really, really high end. It's like, 
how did they pay for that? You know, how, who is this person? Um, um, when that happens, it, it takes away your sense of being a designer and makes you into someone who's just an errand boy or girl in this case. Um, just go out and find the thing that the director tells you to. And I feel very undervalued when that happens, that they're not trusting my reasons, my expertise or my reasons why I've chosen a something. And I'm very flexible, but that is difficult for me because you can't just say no. You have to figure out how to say yes. Uh, right. Uh, but the other side of that is also that what will end up happening is um, if you have producers or uh, or um, or line producers who are nervous about the budget and don't trust that you know how to run a budget, and so they're questioning your every action or every or every spend on every single thing. Uh, maybe they worked in the past with someone who had wild overages and they don't trust that you know that you'll be returning, you know, nine of these 10 things, but this 10th thing is the right one. Or it becomes some kind of thing where the director wanted something wildly more expensive. You've gone over it with everybody, but then they're nickel and diming on this thing that was introduced and saying, oh, well, you have to stay in the budget. But you just added 800 people. Like I've literally had this situation. Um, and it's frustrating because you think you're trying to be a reasonable person and work with people and make them understand, okay, these are the parameters, please work with me. Then you, it, you end up having to go and defend your position, which means you're losing time on the things that you really need to be doing, which is finding the clothes for everybody else. Is there any way to sit down with them and show them the math of the budget and the, the expenses and explain to them that logically, you know, this is what you have and this is what you can do um, and there needs to be some kind of a compromise to make it all work? I've, I've to some degree of success, I've had good uh, situations where that's worked and bad situations where, that, where that's worked. A lot of times it happens when there's somebody who's green, who's doing it, um, or has is working in a very different uh, bracket of spending, uh, budgetary spending, um, and they're not used to knowing where to let things go and where to pull back. Um, and again, that makes me sound like I'm a diva and that I'm, you know, saying, well, this is how we need it and this needs to be done. And I've had producers tell me, okay, well, just make it work. And I have, but it feels like it takes blood to do it. And I don't think that this business should take blood. I really don't. You know, there's far too many other things that you give up to be able to partake in this. Aren't you hired for your uh, experience and your track record? I would think that they would trust you with something like the budget. I think that some people will pay attention to the track record. I think some people are gift to work with. They know what they do. They know how to hire well and then let that person do their job and get out of their way unless they need to step in. Um, and then they, there's other people who don't. Um, there's all sorts of personalities in this business and you have to be flexible. You have to work with everybody. Um, you know, I, I think that, for instance, as far as I go as, with fittings or with nude scenes or set costuming or whatever, I'm a bit of a formalist. You know, I'm not going to be buddy, buddy, jokey, jokey with someone when I'm standing there wearing clothes and they're not. Um, that doesn't make me their best friend. But on the other hand, I'm fully aware that the next project that they go on, they're not my buddy. They're working on a project and eight weeks from now or you know, whatever, they're on to the next thing. They've got a whole new set of friends. So I think that in some ways it's false to think anything else. Um, there's other people who approach the business very differently where um, they they, they make very good friends with the actors and those actors are friends of theirs for a long time. Um, it's a personal dynamic. My personal comfort level is that if somebody is 
in a vulnerable state in front of me, I'm not going to be casual. That's just me. So it's the same thing with, but it's the same thing with, with producers or, um, or any other person that you're interacting with in, on a film set that you have to have your own voice, know what your comfort levels are as long as they're, you know, professional and you work from there. You can't, you can't assume somebody else's voice. What do you think are some things that would surprise people to know about your department? I mean, I am learning a whole lot about your department. There's so much that goes into it that I didn't even realize and so many different um, departments and tasks and responsibilities that are all involved when doing costuming. Well, uh, ADs like to call us the vanities or the pretty committee or other really kind of trivializing words. Um, and I would love for, you know, the grips and electrics and, and everybody else to know that it's not just a vanity, actually, frankly, mostly the producers, but <laughs> it's not just vanity. Yes, you can make a film that's set in one day without wardrobe, but you're going to lose so much nuance and so much character development and so much detail that you're going to lose a lot of the story. Um, and it, does, and it does get noticed. And it, even if it's noticed by the fact that the, the actors don't know what they're doing. Like, one thing that makes me nuts is when somebody's saying, oh, well, just pull from the actor's closet on a very low-budget movie. Just pull something. Well, what if that, that person isn't that character? They're not going to have that in their closet. So these ideas that, you know, oh, my wife likes to shop, so she could be the designer on this, is so fallacious that to reduce us to just vanities is really kind of disrespectful. Yes, it is. And then how about all the period pieces? You really need to know your, um, you need, really need to do the research and really know about the, the time period and the culture and what was common to wear back then. In truth, historical pieces are in some ways are, are easier than contemporary because with contemporary, the actor's egos and the director's sense of, this store, that store, whatever, is already in place. If it's historical, there are much more uh, set guidelines because the images are already there. It already exists in time and space. However, especially with historical drama that takes place with something that's um, uh, biographical or something, however, those are actually amazing because you can take the real photos and replicate them into real life moments. That's so much fun. Yes. And it's probably so much fun to create the costumes. It is. But the other side of that is for instance, let's say it's something like dangerous liaison. You have to have, um, uh, the marquees really pop out. So she's in that butter yellow, uh, silk satin, dress that she floats through the room and you know she's a powerful woman or um the marquise or the Mar uh not the marquise the um madame de martoy who's in those kind of little winsome sweet uh viney um pieces um so they they pop in different ways on the screen where you still have this room full of sumptuous dresses or um the leopard the 1963 or at Lancaster, but it's all set in Sicily during the 1860s uh, movie. Um, uh, this Conti, I think it is. Uh, the Leopard, the, the scenes where they're all in the ballroom are famous because of the way that, you know, the, the leads pop. Even though there's so much, that, I mean, it's filmed in Technicolor, all right. Um, and it's so sumptuous. And there's subtleties within that when you're choosing the palette so that you have um, pieces come and go and recede and reflect power and reflect winsomeness. And they're very, very subtle choices. But even in something like I worked on uh, The Age of Innocence many years ago, and um, uh, um, Countess Alexa, who's the Michelle Pfeiffer's character, when she first enters uh, into the opera, she's wearing a bright red dress which wasn't necessarily something that would have been done at the period, but um, Gabriella Pastucci made it pop. So it becomes almost a singer sergeant painting. You know, you're, you're almost working with, with the lighting and the matte, place, uh, matte placing to create tableaus 
that you know who who's your lead, where do you find your lead, where is the antagonist, where is the conflict, and you can see them come together in the costume when you deal with masters like that. So what is your proudest moment as a costume designer? I think my proudest moments as a costume designer might be uh, I've gotten a couple of pieces, uh, a couple of films that I've designed um, win a bunch of prizes. But uh, I think it's mostly the smaller moments when a, a person in a fitting puts on a garment and suddenly understands their character from within. They look in the mirror and I can see their head cock and they go, oh, huh. And they'll turn to me, what were you thinking of for this? And if we kind of meet of, yes, this was the thing I was thinking and they, they click onto it. That makes me happy. That makes me happy. Yes. Because it means that I've gotten it right. And then it surpasses ego. It surpasses performance. It's just suddenly they are the character. Speaking of that, what kind of influence do you have over the final product? I know that we were talking about producers and directors getting involved and um, giving, giving their ideas of what they think it should be. But do you have the overall control over that or not? You know, I offer 10 pieces of which I could go with any of the 10, but I have a definite favorite or two. Um, plus, you're also building closets oftentimes with, with major characters who are in multiple scenes. You want to be able to say, okay, well, this works, this works, this works. And then it's almost like you have, I mean, it's called a closet because then you can go into their closet and say, I think that today they're wearing this. And this scene, because it's important and I like this shirt and it looks best for this and it'll go really well in that bar, this will be this one. You know, you base it on the pivotal scene within the day or if there are multiple pivotal scenes or this one I can have duplicates made, this one I can't. So you're doing a bit of math on those things, figuring out where you want certain things. Um, but uh, I don't necessarily know if I have control over the product. I think because I ask about the stock and the process that we're going through and what it's going to look like and I do... Um, I do test camera tests beforehand if I have the opportunity and I try to always have the opportunity to really test things in front of camera and make sure that I like how the lighting looks and how the thing is going to look on camera um, to really try to build the character story with my costumes. And it's up to the director and the editor to really make it once it's out of my hands. I have a question. Um, which do you like better? Do you like theater or do you like film better? Yeah. Right. What I love also is when you have a conversation with the production designer and they riff off of you and you have this kind of back and forth and you walk in on the day and all of it's coming together. I'm like, I have one, um, I have one production designer I've worked with a number of times and he would come over to me like, Eden, Eden, I found this couch. I think it's really going to go really well with that dress. And it's one of those, that's awesome. Or, hey, do you remember that conversation we had about the painting? Look, that painting is now on the wall. I love that. Yeah. I like, I like the intimacy of film. Um, I like how theater changes over and over and over again. It's definitely a living being. Um, but I've also seen there's a certain kind of delivery that I can hear from different schools, especially, you know, Juilliard and um, Juilliard and Yale drama school. They have very specific deliveries in how they emote on stage. And sometimes it's a little hard for me because I can pick up where they went to school based on how they emote. Um, 
for instance, like a really weird thing, like Rain Wilson went to NYU for grad school. And I remember seeing him in this thing called the new Bazina that he did as part of his, um, his grad project that went a little ways and frankly was brilliant, but it didn't catch the, the public flair. I think, um, I really enjoyed seeing it, but whenever I would see him on the office, I would, I would look at him and go, ah, new Bazina. I hear it in you. I see it in you. It's right. It's right there. I don't know if that makes any sense. Uh, but it's a specific, it's a specific voice that those schools give that I hear, um, I don't hear as much when I see a really well acted piece of film where it's really emotionally set. And that's not fair to the theater because I do love theater. And I think theater can be fun and theater can be moving and theater can be amazing and dramatic. And I love it when it's, um, it's, you know, plays like Labyrinth does them and, um, Stephen Adley Gierges and all these, these people who are not coming from the classical upper middle class white sensibilities of what theater should be, you know? Um, so corrupting the dialogue in order to make an entirely new form is fantastic. And I want more of that, but I'm acutely aware that I'm in a theater. What about doing a show like Cirque du Soleil? Would you like doing something like that where you could be totally creative with, um, color and fantasy type costumes? Well, that's a funny thing because you think that they could be, um, super creative. But if you get right down to it, they're really, really stringent because first of all, you need high performance four way stretch fabrics that won't, that'll resist being sweat in day in, day out, multiple washings pretty much all the time. Things that can't just be wiped out, but need to be washed out all the time. Things that can incorporate safety straps and harnesses in an elegant way. Um, things that allow the performer not to, hurt themselves. And also there's something that I refer to as standing costumes versus working costumes. A standing costume is like, if you go and look at the, um, when the Met has their, their ball, their annual ball, um, of their gala, and you see all of the women posing in these precarious hats and gowns. And there's a, you know, somebody standing off camera is just fluff the dress to make it look beautiful while they stand there. They're not moving. They're standing. They're posing. That can't ever be the case with a gymnast because the minute that it's like, oh, we'll just tie on the strap and the strap doesn't hold on their shoe and then it goes sliding down their leg and then it catches on the harness and then they plummet to their death. That's kind of a problem. While we're on this subject of theater and working with dancers and skaters and acrobats, do you think because it is dealing with sweating and, you know, um, washing the costumes a lot and they have to be durable because it's every single night and they have to be functional for them to do their job, do you think this is a good place for someone that's just starting out to to start with? No, because I think that, I think that the technical needs are so stringent that you would lose your ability to think outside of that. And so, um, for instance, uh, there's something called, called more. So you can't use a certain kind of high contrast pattern, uh, on camera because of uh, in the old days, the shutter speed, um, it really depends on the cameras for digital now, but the shutter speed wasn't the same as your eye shutter, your eye mimic to shutter speed. And so when you would look at something, uh, on TV, uh, it would do, it would strobe or moire. Okay. Uh, the pattern would. So I came up in the eighties, nineties, and I was taught you never buy a high contrast pattern that's tight together, like a hound's tooth or something like that. You can do that on digital now because it's both digital broadcasting, digital theaters, and digital cameras have more or less erased things like that or the fact that red bleeds on camera um, or 
hot white strobes out on camera because of color temperature stuff. But, um, but even to this day, if I'm, you know, shopping for a shirt for my boyfriend or something, if I see something that's in a high contrast, even if this is not for camera, my eye says, no, I don't want that because it's not my taste. I've weeded it out of myself. So if I grew up and I'm designing for years for the circus or for perform- or, uh, acrobats or for ice dancers or something like that, where I have to be very aware that these are athletes with dangerous situations and then they say, okay, we'll do this, you know, costume drama. And I'm thinking, well, how are we going to control the, um, the mesh on the top so that the the decollete isn't so low? It's not the same thing. You get stuck. And I don't want to get stuck as a designer. I want to be able to have the, the, um, the faculty to jump from one thing to another, to another, and have my hands in all of the pots to say, okay, well, I can play with this fabric and this fabric and this fabric and this idea, and this is not wrong. This is right for this thing. It's not right for that thing. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does make sense. But now, do you think then that theater is harder than film? It's a completely different animal. It's a, it's a completely different animal. I mean, for instance, with theater, you build it like a Mack truck so that it looks as a delicate flower. But, you know, you'll have giant hooks and eyes and things like that on the back of a skirt so that it can fit the 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 lead, the understudy, you know, the person who's in the bus and truck show. And it has a life that can go on as long as it can. Um, whereas, you know, you'd end up on camera with something like that and you'd have the camera pay loving attention to every curve of the woman. And all of a sudden you've got this ugly detail and then they're focused on it. Since you've been working from the very beginning, have you seen changes in your department? The industry has changed wildly, wildly. There's a bunch of things that have happened. Um, One thing that happened is the technology has changed uh, as far as how big a camera, how expensive a camera, the film, the, there's not film stock used in the same way. It's much cheaper to, to roll at this point. So almost anybody has a very low threshold on what they can make. Um, the contracts for the unions have changed wildly uh, to incorporate more projects, but that also means that there's a lot of people with cheap cameras uh, and cheap crews running around making movies, which aren't necessarily as well thought out as they could be. And I'm not saying that you need, you know, a crew of 10,000. It's just um, sometimes things aren't thought out as well as they could be and given the resources that they really need because X still costs X. Um, and then a third thing that happened that was a major thing was Lehman Brothers which meant that people became much more risk averse to unknown uh, projects and unknown stories and unknown filmmakers. And the division between um, high end studio films that had multiple hundreds of millions of dollars in um, investment to it and the very lower end uh, independent film market, uh, the, the middle dropped away hardcore for a very long time. It's starting to come back, but in a different way, because uh, the fourth thing that changed was distribution models, where you're not depending on um, on festivals in the same way as you used to. You can get uh, direct territorial distribution. You can get web distribution. You can start on the web and get, uh, get bought out to re-up for something more commercial. There's all sorts of different models at this point. So, Based on, I mean, and there's, you know, uh, Showtime, Net, Net, uh, Showtime, Netflix, and Amazon now all have their own studios running. Um, so all of the different models came in. There's all sorts of different ways to capitalize, but it's, but um, the middle fell out. It's, it's really just that simple. The middle fell out. So. Um, there's so many ways that the industry is different from when I started. It's kind of astounding, frankly. You know, people still need clothes. Were there any technologies that were developed that made things easier uh, for your department and for you? 
Um, specific, very granularly specific technologies like um, uh, Sync on Set, which is a cloud-based uh, um, system for tracking and organizing um, costume changes, uh, are in place now. There's a couple of others uh, that go through the computer now so that it's much more web-based as far as speed of getting approvals and seeing how something is going to look. Silly things that I've taught to some of my students in the past. Um, if you want to know what a process will look like on camera, there's all sorts of filters out there that you can get for cheap or free. Like you can go through Instagram and take a photo of a costume. And then if you want to see what it'll look like with um, a bleach process, you can lay that over and say, oh, this works, this doesn't. Um, or a high contrast something. You know, you can play with it and really figure things out based on, you know, this brick in your pocket. But, um, but on the other hand, within all of that, te- within all the technology and all of the cheaper ways of making film, I do feel like some of the, um, the art and the knowledge is lost as well, because we've gotten back towards, uh, if anybody can make movies, nobody needs to have expertise, but understanding fit but understanding fit is one of the most important things that a designer can do. Understanding intrinsically the, the idea of how something fits and moves on the body for many, many different kinds of bodies, not just, oh, well, she's an actress, so she's a size 2, and she's going to be uh, 34B, isn't fair to all of the other bodies out there and all of the other people, and you're doing a disservice if that's the only way that you can possibly conceive of a person. For instance, I have for my for my plus size line, my line is from a 12 to 24. I had a stylist approach me to uh, to pull some pieces from my line uh, for a woman who was a size 12. And at the time, for this particular piece that she wanted, I only had sample sizes in a size 20. And she said, she said to me, oh, but you know, it's plus size. It's all about the same. So the fact that as a petite person herself, who was also a stylist who was used to working with petite people, the idea that she couldn't conceptualize that there is a difference between a, t- uh, between a size 12 and a size 20 to the point that it was, you know, uh, sizes zero through six and then sizes eight and up are just in blob. They're just blob. We can't, I can't conceptualize that. Does a disservice to every actor that she works with. It had me incensed. So um, it, it, it helps to know fit. It helps to know how clothes move. It helps to know the hand of a fabric. And that's something that you can get through working over and over with different textiles, different costumes. Let's talk a little bit about your clothing line. First of all, what made you decide to create a plus-size clothing line? When I was working uh, on bigger budget um films and television, especially in television, I would go to Saks, I would go to Barney's, I would go to Bergdorf, um, Bendel's, Fred Siegel, you name it, at these very high levels, and I would go pull clothes for actresses and actors. Um, And I love touching the clothes. I'm kind of a fabric snob, and um, I love going in and touching the clothes and looking at the new shapes and seeing the ingenuity of the cuts and what people were doing as far as making style. And there was nothing there in plus sizes. Now, I myself am a plus size woman. And it wasn't a matter of, oh, if I had $10,000 for this dress, I could buy this dress. Or let me just go and take this and try it on and then put it back on the rack. It literally didn't exist. So my idea when I started the company was if... Uh, Barney's or Bergdorf's or Fred Siegel carried plus sizes, this is what they would carry. And that's been my inform- my informing sensibility throughout the whole thing. It keeps a very clear product quality line for me. How long have you been doing your own clothing line? Three years. And uh, we were the first plus size line to ever show at New York Fashion Week last year and September 2013. Yep. Made history. 
Is there anything out here in L.A. that people can see? Right now, there is a bunch of places online that I can point you to, uh, including my own e-commerce shop, which is uh, www.store.cabiriastyle, C-A-B-I-R-I-A-S-T-Y-L-E.com. Um, and then there's, a, uh, there's stores on the Cabiria Style website. Um, right now, we don't have... Right now, we don't have any in California, but uh, working on it all the time. I do have stores across the U.S. and in the U.K. that carry my pieces. And this line is for everybody, for the everyday woman, not just specifically for actors, correct? It's for everybody who wants a little more flair. It's definitely for a bolder woman who uh, who is confident in her skin. And is it only high fashion pieces or do you offer all different kinds of clothing for plus size women? It's ready to wear. It's a uh, very transitional clothing, three season, usually uh, office wear, day wear, you know, you can go to a party, you can go to a function, uh, but it's very approachable, accessible clothing. And has any of your clothing been used in any of the projects that you've worked on in film or shows? The great part about working with other costume designers over the years is that I've been very lucky. Um, Tina Negro had pulled a piece for me from me. I'm sorry. Tina Negro had pulled several pieces from me for uh, a Fox pilot and series that ended up not getting aired, but she did use quite a few of my pieces in there. Uh, Ingrid Price used some of my pieces on Nurse Jackie. Um, there were some pieces on Under the Dome. Um, I really got a bunch of people interested. Plus, I was able to access some celebrities and have pieces pulled for um, for Laverne Cox and uh, Mary Lambert. And I had some pieces sent out as options for um, Melissa McCarthy, although they ended up going in another direction. But I really gotten the attention of a lot of people in part because of uh, New York Fashion Week. So I've been very lucky in that. Wow, that is great. Congratulations. Yeah, no, it makes me really happy. And it also makes me happy to work with costume designers too, because I know what they're doing. I know exactly why they want to pull. I know how the loan out works for how long they want it for their, for their fitting. It's not scary to me. I'm not asking a bunch of questions. And so it makes it easy for both of us to do business with each other. So... Let's talk about soap operas. Um, how is that different from doing wardrobe for film and TV? Uh, I worked on soap operas back in the golden days when soap operas rolled the earth as an assistant, as a shopper. And um, it was so over the top because, you know, if somebody went to dinner, it was in a fully beaded, vermicelli bead, Versace gown with one shoulder and and giant rocks for earrings and necklaces that match. Um, one of the things I remember very clearly is we had a lot of our um, jewelry custom made because so much of the, of the jewelry was too dainty for these particular women. I mean, uh, I wasn't in the era of dynasty, but it was shortly after was when I was working on soap operas. And, um, and so we had a couple of people that we went to who would make these ginormous things. And it always, it always cracked me up because it would be, they'd be well made, but it was like, if you took three enormous, uh, Kenneth J. Lane pieces and put them together, it was like, all right, well, that's tasteful, you know? So everything was a big statement. Everything jumped across the, the camera uh, even with those silly lights, you know, and the video treatment. Actually, that's not true because uh, the first one I worked on was shot on film, and then I moved over to another one that was shot on video stock. So you could see that the treatment became different as far as uh, the budgets were different, definitely different. Um, and you always tried to get texture, uh, a lot of boucle, a lot of fake Chanel jackets, uh, when we were doing um, video, just to give it some kind of tooth, um, but you know, you you don't really get too invested in the characters or anything like that. But um, uh, it was it was fun. 
because, you know, you got to go and be big and bold in everything. So then is it easier for you to pull something together for a soap opera? In some ways, no, because you're sitting there and you're saying, okay, well, this gold lame is next to this turquoise patent leather, and now the gold is looking drab, you know? At what point are you amping it up? At what point is 11 not high enough, you know? What would you suggest to someone who's just starting out in the business? Uh, I would say look on Mandy, look on Craigslist, look on any crew job uh, site that you can uh, to see if somebody is hiring for interns, for one. Um, Hopefully you'll get in with a crew that knows what they're doing. Um, But at the very least, if you keep your mouth shut and your ears open and do things with diligence, um, you will you will learn whether whether or not you learn the exact skills that you need. That's in some ways on you, uh, you know, to kind of pull through and say, okay, this person knows what they're doing versus I don't think this person knows what they're doing. But um, what I will say, one thing that has always made me crazy is when I'm trying to teach someone a task and they're very busy chatting or looking at their phone as opposed to paying attention to the task, because usually what I'm doing is I'm giving you a task to see how well you perform it before I give you a harder task or uh, something more complex. And the more you can sail through, the higher you'll go within, within my department, which means that you'll go on to the next one with recommendation. So be diligent, pay attention. That small task is still important. Having you sort out the boots by size is a pain in the butt, yes. However, it needs to be done so that when you get out there on the day and the they're calling for you. It's five o'clock in the morning and we need uh, a size 11, a size 12 and a size 13 boot. You know where exactly where to go and you're not wasting time. It's just simple things like that. You know, do you think people can get into the costume department without having any knowledge or training in costuming or fashion design? Interest is always a good place to start. You know, Um, you can't always have experience in every single thing that you do. But expressing interest, and again, diligence, is a big deal. So people notice that. People notice when you're on point and you're present and, you know, you don't have to kind of snap your fingers to get your attention. You're present. Um, So if you're interested in the task and if you're thinking about the task, hopefully you're working with someone who explains to you the reason for the thing instead of just yells at you to go do something. But also, if you don't know what this particular thing is for and you feel like you're spinning off without any parameters, for you to ask them what they need is helpful. If you had the power to change anything in the costume department, what would that be? I always wish that there was better communication with everyone. I always wish for clean, clean, clear communication, not just... I only want to know the thing that I care about right in this moment, but I wish that there was follow through and people would be able to have a minute to communicate clearly with each other. I think it, I think it would save a lot of headaches. And that's it for Crew Call. If you'd like to support the podcast, remember to click the Amazon link on the Tapa website before you go shopping. It doesn't cost you anything, and Amazon gives us a little kickback. Everyone wins. And if you like what you've heard, please consider leaving us a review on iTunes. Good or bad, we really appreciate the feedback. Thanks again to Eden for explaining the intricacies of the costume department. Tune in next time for another fascinating crew member.